What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. We are live right now. If you're listening, you could be listening on the podcast later on, but we are live on uh, social media. And I'm the founder of inspiredinsider.com where I talk with and interview some of the most inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. I have three amazing people today, which I'm going to introduce in a second. And we're going to be talking about task value versus impact value. And um, that's not something I came up with. We were chatting before we hit record here. And so I cannot take credit for that. And um, but we'll explain what that means, which is looking in the eyes of your clients and customers and showing them the benefits of what you do. OK, and so we're going to go through that. And I have three really smart people to go through that with me today. Before we get into it, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25 at, at Rise 25. We help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships by helping you run your podcasts. So it generates you amazing relationships and hopefully a referrals to your business. And, you know, as everyone here knows, um, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. And over the past over 10 years, I've found no better way to do that than profile some of the smartest and, you know, companies and people I admire on the podcast to share what they do. And so without further ado, um, you can check out rise25.com to learn more if you've thought about creating a podcast or doing a podcast. And today's guest, I'm going to introduce one by one. Um, we have Carl Ponto. He's owner of Squash and Stretch Productions. And, you know, when companies need to explain complex concepts, generate more revenue and strengthen their brand <laughs> presence online, Carl and his team produce these exceptional stories using high quality and custom animated content. And we'll hear from him on exactly how they do that. And um, Bruce Lafetra, you know, he is called, as you could see, the client whisperer. And it's because he takes the guesswork out of marketing services and he goes to the source, asks the right questions, and he helps people reveal how to think like their best clients. So because if you think like your best clients, you know, uh, Bruce, you they attract more of those same clients, which is amazing. So we're going to talk about that. And Jason Cement is the founder of Get Visible, which is a digital marketing agency. They have offices in Beverly Hills, Phoenix. And people call Jason if you want a website, not to, just a website, but actually as revenue to your business, as revenue and as bottom line to your business. So they create remarkable websites that um, convert and that they promote in you know, so, you know, search engine rankings, online ad campaigns, social media, and all of that. Thank you all for joining me today. Thank you. Jason, I kind of want to start with you. Um, I know you're a busy man with a busy schedule, so you may have to pop off early, but you know, we are talking about task value versus impact value. And how do you demonstrate not just the features, not even just the benefits, but, you know, the results. Um, and I'll, I'm going to let you um, just go from there and share your screen. And I think you may, uh, yeah. And um, share a little bit about your wisdom with us. Okay. So I'm going to share, I'm giving a presentation later this week, so I'm giving you a sneak preview before anyone else has seen this. And I'm just going to give three slides from the presentation. So our agency, we design websites, as you said before, and we get traffic to the websites, which is the majority of the work that we do. And so I want to just focus for today on search engine optimization and explain how we've distilled it down to three things. There's content, which is you have to have the keywords in the content. These are all different types of content you can create in the website. You have to do the coding, which in our world we call on page, which is make sure that the website's fast, that it passes Google speed tests and it's mobile friendly tests. But you also have to make sure that the experience of the website keeps people on there for a longer time and that it's just a good, has good conversion concept. And then the last thing is called connections here which is another way of saying backlinks and uh, getting websites that uh, people on their websites to post content, which has a link back to your website, which could also include social media mentions. So when you talk about what, and when someone says, oh, I have an optimized website, it's not a point in time. It's an ongoing like turtle versus the hare type of thing. You, you never win the race, but your goal is to always be ahead in the race. 
So one other slide I want to show you is the steps behind what we call on-page optimization. I'll get there in a second. Uh, I should have had this. Here we go. So this is called technical SEO. These are 12 different things that contribute to rankings. I'm not going to go through all 12. I just wanted to give you an idea that when you talk about optimization, I gave you three things, content, uh, commun uh, connections, and coding. This is what's behind the scene of all of that. So I'm going to explain on one website what we did for a client of ours that produced a significant ranking. And it's something that you can do for uh, your own website, because that's ultimately the idea is we want to teach people to do what they can on their own and hire us because they don't have the time or they're lazy. So this is a website that sells sewing machines and sewing machine parts. And it's very sexy industry. Very sexy, right? So what we did was we, you can see here, this is January 20, 2020 versus January 2021. So we got his keywords just alone in the, on the top three positions of Google, went from 371 to 703, and then from 1600 to 2600. So the amount of keywords, I mean, overall, 14,000 to 24,000, but really it's just the first page that matters. He went from 2,000 to 3,300. It's over 100% growth in, in the rankings, which produced 114% growth in traffic, but a 200% growth in sales. So he went from 4,200 transactions to almost 13,000 transactions in one year. So what was the cause of doing that? So what we did is what we call aggressive content creation and optimization. So first we created four blogs a month. And what we do is we hire people that are experienced in that industry. We used to have a professional writer on staff to write for a bunch of clients, but it became more efficient to find people that are retired or that are looking for a side hustle of a second job and hire them to write blogs. Then we also created tutorials on how to use the machines, how to, use, how to put your uh, finger into a thimble and use it so you don't jam a needle into your finger. Just different things. That That's important. About. It's very important, right? And, and then figure out what are the terms. Now, there's two types of keyword phrases that you should know about. I'll show you another slide for a second because this came up. There's something called reputational keywords. That's where someone knows the brand and they're just looking to sort of validate your credibility. So if someone would type in something related to Gold Star, they want to be found. But the ones for e-commerce are more often lead oriented. They don't know your brand and they want to discover that you want them to discover you online. So for example, here, this is a company that's a consulting firm. If you type in the name of their firm, they show up here, but they also show up on the right side, which is called your Google My Business listing. But let's assume that you knew the person who was at the company. All of a sudden you type in her name, the Google My Business listing is not showing up. So this person forgot or didn't know that she could also attach her name to her listing. And so from a reputational standpoint, there's a gap here. But from a That's lead, pretty cool. Yeah, so from a lead standpoint which is really related to uh, e-commerce because most people are not checking out the brand, they're really trying to find a product, they just don't know who to buy it from. So here it's not an e-commerce link, but again, this is the preview of the presentation. Look at all the different types of listings that can come up in terms of content. So someone's looking for a coach in Silicon Valley. They don't know this lady named Christy. Here, a LinkedIn profile comes up. The people also ask, which are questions about executive coaches. Then you have an actual uh, four listings, which are actually coaching sites. And then a fifth one is an in information like Quora, so, which is not a coaching site, but they have content. So if we come back to this Gold Star tool, we created all sorts of different types of content between blogs and tutorials. And then here are social media uh, postings that we did. When you put it all together, we increased page one visibility, like I said, by uh, 1,294 keywords, which produced, I say, I don't know if you say twice the sales or three times the sales, but it went from you know 4,200 to 12,000. So bottom line is, we added all this content, and if you remember, I showed you that there's this chart here of all the different things you have to do for technical. Content is just stage one. Then you have to do all the other things to optimize that content to make Google really respond to it. So yeah. that's sort of the SEO thing in under five minutes. No, I like what you said because really essentially what it is is you want to just get as much real estate on 
the first page of Google as possible. And so I like how you broke down. There's different elements of that. There's paid elements, there's SEO elements, there's even the Google My Business listing elements, which seems like a low hanging fruit that probably most people are not even doing and trying to capture as much real estate. And obviously from what you described, you know, there could be areas of real estate of blogs or questions, and there's other for the actual site, which would be on site. So you're basically trying to help people capture as much real estate on that first page as possible. Right? Correct. Correct. You, you yeah. actually made a great point because that yeah. is true that they, that there isn't just the, uh, uh, the normal ranking that you would think of, of just a content page. It could be yeah, a if you rank a content page, well, great. Now you don't have paid or you don't have some of those other things that you've, you showed that are built out. You know? Right. Now, if yeah. we have another minute, I'll share with you one last slide from here, which is sort of relevant. It's not a strategy. This is why do most SEO efforts hit a fault line or a brick wall? Mm. So I thought this was more of a discussion point that we may follow at a later time, but your audience may uh, like to see this because, for example, I'm running a survey on LinkedIn no clear SEO plan is the clear winner of the reasons why people are not succeeding at SEO. It's not because they're being outspent by competitors. It's not because mm. they don't want to spend. It's not even because they think they don't have the right content. It's they simply don't have a clear plan to follow. And so that's the biggest suggestion I can give that is, is SEO plans are sort of like diets. If you find a plan that makes sense to you and you actually follow it, you're going to see the rankings unless it's a bad plan, but uh, right. you know, we could go down the diet route <laughs> at some point, but I won't, I won't take us off. And Jason, I know you got to hop off, but, uh, but thanks for hopping in and, and sharing your expertise. Um, and what I wanted to do is, you know, like I was saying in the beginning, um, I didn't come up with the task value versus impact value and actually showing the benefits. Uh, Bruce, um, I'd love for you to maybe explain that a little bit further on what that means and and we can talk through it a little bit. Uh, absolutely. So most, and I work with a lot of professionals, but you can think about this in terms of products as well. Um, most people think in terms of task-based value is what I call task-based value. And that's what you do. People say, you know, Jeremy, what do you do? You do podcasts. Um, I often use the example of a lawyer that drafts a contract. There's no value in the contract, even though they'll talk to about how great they are in their experience, but there's, it's a piece of paper. Where the value comes is what the client can do with that contract. They're able to enter some new business. They're able to form a partnership. They're able to, it's a sales contract. They get revenue in more consistently and faster. That's impact on the client. So it's not what you do. It's what the client can do because of what you do. And that's the impact-based value. If you speak in impact based value as opposed to task based value now you're starting to think the way your clients think because they don't think about what you do they think about the impact is on their business now most of us you know most of the world goes and talks in task based value so the client has to translate the impact on their business into what you do and there's a chance for loss why have the chance for loss or misunderstanding why not just go straight to where the client is and speak their language life is easier it's better too I love it. And you had a specific client that was a law firm. Can you tell me a little bit what happened there? Yeah, I was I was actually thinking about that. I thought there's I, I was thinking about a consulting firm that I like even better for the, the example. Okay, but, uh, go ahead. And so so in this case, there were four principles. I got, uh, this was a very technical engineering consulting firm, and they were taking over from the founder. And they thought, wow, if we're going to be partners, we want to have partner income, not principal income. So they said, we need to grow the firm. But then they said, we all have PhDs. How are we, where do we even start? And um, they had great relationships with their clients, but they didn't know how to go get more of them. And they had a small firm that they wanted to maintain the culture. They didn't want to just grow wantonly. They wanted to grow with more of the clients that they have so they could maintain this very high margin, very nice business that they had. They just wanted it to be bigger. So um, by going out and interviewing their clients, in, in essence, reverse engineering the best client relationships they have and sort of asking them, what do you think? Why do pe people come to you? Let's go talk to the clients. Let's go to the source. And we found their true differentiator, which is that they actually understood how their clients, their, their work supports their client's decision process. They do a lot of litigation support. So how does the insurance company think about 
Do we litigate? Do we settle? Where do we settle? And so they're, they're, what they do is create a big report with lots of science in it. But the impact is the insurance company's assets. They're stewarding the in, insurance company's assets. Do we settle? Do we, do we uh, litigate? They've done this intuitively. I had no idea what they actually did. What by reverse engineering the process is we brought it to the surface. And so by thinking like their clients, they're now able to see the difference between what they do and the impact that they create for their clients. And by focusing on the impact, they're able to attract more of their best clients. It's a lot of times, you know, it's really hard when you're too close to it to really identify what's unique about you. Like, so I feel like when you ask people's best clients, they, it's probably very clear to them, I imagine. And when you do a deep dive, it becomes even clearer to the company. Do you, find, I, 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 do you find companies are kind of blind to it just because they're doing their everyday thing and they, they don't, it doesn't stick out to them of what they're, what's unique about them or? Well, it's, it's, it's more than that. There's two factors. One is that how they, a lot of expertise and, and, the, and the tasks that they do, that's really important for delivering for clients. That's how you deliver the, the great results. But that's not necessarily why clients select you. And so to be able to separate why are people hiring you versus how do you deliver on that hired promise is, is important. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing about unique is, uh, and as you get into consumer products, you know, unique and the ideal and, you know, B2B professional services kinds of things, software. Um, so it's a little bit different space, but you don't have to be as unique as everyone says you have to be, because if you can align your thinking with the way the client thinks, once they have confidence that you understand how they're thinking and that that's how you're aligning your goals, that's how trust gets established. And once you have trust, then you just need to be able to do the job. And from that standpoint, and so you say, well, there's nothing unique about that, except that none of your competitors are doing this. So you're standing out by highlighting what you, how you create value as opposed to you're the, you're the surfboard, you know, riding lawyer. Um, nobody cares about that. So much differentiation out there in marketing is is made up to because it matters to the uh, the vendor, not the buyer. How does and it? And it's noise. <laughs> yeah. So Bruce, like, so you know, basically, you're doing a deep dive. You find these differentiations, some of the you know the USPs of this company and what, how they're delivering value to their clients, um, and you you come up with this end result. How does it translate? How do the companies use it? Like, oh, great. Talk great, about great that. Question. So, so I'm a purely strategic play. So I create a foundation, a strategic marketing map. And then that creates, a, think of it as a starting line at the they get start 50 yard line when Jason or Carl or, or a marketing agency comes in and does their thing, as opposed to trying to guess and figure out what what are the, the things that really drive people to that, this, uh, this business? A lot of times, you know, an agency will say, well, we do 10 things for everyone in your industry. You have to do all those 10 things. Well, what, after my work with them and they're thinking like their clients, they realize that well, for our clients, there's only two of those things. Maybe it's different for other companies. We don't care about other companies, but for us, these two are what drive the vast majority of our clients to select us. And so now the, the tactical, whether it's the website, whether it's animations, whether it's you know, general branding, now is starting at the 50 yard line or further in terms of being able to create impact. So I don't do any of that stuff, I just make it better. Mm -hmm. But you make recommendations on that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I'm gonna to try to work with people that, that you know, want, to, uh, want to make the client successful as opposed to merely you know, show people how creative they are. What's something you be creative, but you you got to have results at the end of the day. That's why Jason's wonderful because you know Jason focuses so much on results. I guess I have a question then, Carl. I, I want to do a deep dive because I'm really interested in how you take this course with with clients, also, which is kind of cool. Um, but you know, I know you do a deep dive with clients, right? To come to this, what's um, one question that people are missing out on, they may not be thinking about or asking their clients to, to step in the direction of finding out their differentiator and their benefit to their clients. Um, I mean, I was asking Bruce, uh, oh, Bruce. just to, can, yeah, Bruce, what, what's the one question that you think is 
companies are missing out on by not even asking their clients. And I know there's probably hundreds of questions when you do this deep dive. What's one that sticks out to you that is just like a must ask to start to get to that conclusion of what is the differentiation? So I want to know why a particular client, and then I, I talk about only their best clients. I don't care about their average clients or their poor clients, but the ones that they would clone if they could. Why do those clients choose that firm? Not why do generic clients choose firms like this, but why do their best clients choose their firm? And most companies just don't know. They go back to, well, we have lots of experience or we've been around longer and, and that's rarely the case. And if they mm. talk about price, you know, they're off base. <laughs> what was an answer that, was there any answers in your career that have surprised you when you went to the client and you said, why did you choose this company? And it, it shocked you at this point, maybe you're not shocked by anything, but maybe at the time, what was a shocking answer you got? Well, it's, it's not so much shocking for me. It's, it's often surprising for my clients. And remember, these are their best clients. So it's always, it's almost always good news. I never come in with bad news. Like, oh, you do this totally wrong. It's, it's this, this is what creates value. And, and frequently, um, particularly among professionals, it's about expertise. It's credentials. It's, you know, we've got 25 years of experience. Well, you know what? Their clients don't actually care about their 25 years of experience. The clients care that, hey, you understand our business and you helped us figure out what questions to ask when we were looking on our own and all there were were like people throwing answers at us, you actually helped us navigate through this thicket. And just, that's, a, yeah. that's a huge wake up call for a company that thinks about expertise and they, they promote expertise. They talk to you know agencies and they brand them as experts. And that's not, that's how they deliver, but that's not why they get hired. What were some examples of what people said? Um, I'm wondering if there's something random like, yeah. Oh, like you mentioned the surfboard. Oh, you know, they knew my industry and they also surf or something. I don't know. What are some, some maybe common or not so common answers that you've, you've gotten? It's, it's usually around some, some way of phrasing that, that they, uh, they understand me and my situation. And so the, the magic words I always tell people to listen for, and Carl served this lots of times, is if a prospect says, you get me or words to that effect, You've hit pay dirt because now you're in a position of trust. They understand that you understand what they're trying to accomplish. And now, now it's time to, you know, you've demonstrated the trust. Now it's to say, hey, I can actually do this. And it's a, it's a short road from there. Hmm. Whereas a lot of people take that as a buying sign and then they, they don't know why they're going to get chosen. So they throw a hundred things onto the pile, which overwhelms the prospect and the, and the buying process slows down or stops or, or just, you know, completely ends. And they wonder what happened. We were so close. It's like they screwed it up. Mm. I love it. Yeah. Thanks for, for sharing that. And then, so Carl, for you, when we think of this task value versus impact value, or, you know, we were also discussing kind of inward thinking versus outward thinking. What are your thoughts on that? So first of all, we have a new website coming up. It's going to be launching soon. So take this old one down. <laughs> it pains me to look at it. Just, just stop sharing because we're going to have a new, new thing uh, launching soon. I'm really excited about it. Um, when it comes to, yeah, when it, so uh, when it comes to um, basically the, the task value versus impact value, I mean, the there's actually um, made an animation at the beginning of this year talking about how people aren't really investing in the animation itself and not even really in the story the animation is telling. They're really investing in the results the story has on their audience. Mm -hmm. so there really is re a requirement to know who they're trying to communicate with, who their best clients are, who their best uh, employees are, who their best investors are, whoever they're trying to communicate with and what's going to, uh, what sort of story is going to get the response they want from those, uh, that group of people and and not resonate with people they don't want to uh, connect with. Um, and so really, um, the, I can't emphasize enough how important it is that companies uh, work with Bruce or someone like Bruce to basically figure that stuff out first because it really makes everything else a lot easier. Uh, and when we're working with clients, what we usually often start with asking you first is, okay, what are you trying to accomplish? Who are you trying to reach? Work backwards from there to where they are to figure out what the right message and story is because 
if you don't know what the goals are and who you're trying to um, attract and, and uh, get the attention of, it's really not worth saying anything. Yeah. And um, you had someone that you'd worked with. I'd love to have you walk through a scenario so people can kind of get a sense of sure. that displaying the, like we said, task versus impact value and the benefits to your clients. Um, you had a company that, um, Inovix. Yeah. So um, we worked with a company called Inovix. They're a, a well-funded uh, startup that makes next generation lithium ion battery technology. And they were spending like 45 minutes of an hour long meeting trying to explain to other battery engineers that they had solved this uh, problem with using material called silicon anode, which while it's great for batteries normally, the problem is that it, when as batteries expand and contract, the material separates. And so you only get like 10 charges before the battery's dead. Just That's a big good. pain point. Like yeah, people, so, their battery life on anything, people are like, yeah, yeah like I just so, want it to be longer. Yeah, so another probably if Bruce, if you interviewed Apple, they'd be like, yeah, how do we improve the iPhone? Oh, battery life. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but what Anovix did is they changed the internal structure of the battery so they can use this material, and so by solving that problem, their batteries produce almost twice as much energy and last thirty percent longer. It can use pretty much the same production process as existing batteries with a few drop-in changes. And so we created this animation that explained it really concisely in like two minutes. And we helped them revise their script because they had like the most important information kind of buried halfway through. And no one's going to watch halfway through the animation to get to what they really care about. So we put the most important things right at the beginning. And uh, they loved it. And like two weeks after adding it to the homepage of their website, they announced they're acquiring a publicly traded company and the valuation after the merger is supposed to be like 1.13 billion. And so um, we're really excited to work with them some more after in a big event they have coming up uh, this month, I think. And just uh, the, the telling the right story to the right uh, audience can really have that huge impact on, on the business. Whereas the animation itself is, is not that important, but it's the response and the, re the results the animation generates that they're really, uh, is gonna help them propel their business forward. Yeah, I think anyone thinking about it, Carl, like, well, one, how can you find a more elegant way to actually display the benefits and what you do um, and also saving time, like oh, yeah. for going from 45 minutes to two minutes and they don't even need to take the two minutes because it's in a video form yep. animation format. So it's not just a more elegant way of doing it, but it also is a better way because even if it's, there's a two minute animation it doesn't explain like you know get to what the source of the pain and the benefit is it doesn't even matter right so you really need to pluck out that gem like you said it's buried in the middle you need to have someone to pluck out what that gem is and then just shine it up and show it to people i guess right yeah i mean can, can i jump in and, and two go ahead bruce yeah. horn on this one a little bit because there's there's an aspect of this. I mean, it's, a, it's an amazing animation uh, that really is is just beautiful. But one of the things that he did it was really get to the story, and it's not just explaining the technology, but it, it makes the technology credible. Because there's a little bit of profile change, and the engineers by you know it's okay, it's great technology, but are we going to re-engineer our product to to take this this new battery? That's a big risk. And by being able to show how it was similar and and very credible. Um, that was you know, the, the, the hidden audience, as, as I understood it, you know, when, when Carl walked me through it the first time. Yeah, I mean, the part of the re adjusting the script again is kind of knowing what, the, what your audience is going to care about, because a lot of people write about things they care about and what, they're, what they kind of sell to themselves because they think about what's important to them, but really it helps to know uh, what the audience cares about and what's really going to get them um, emotionally excited about it, because, uh, again, a lot of people, one of the big problems um, even with like uh, a lot of problems that people have is they put too much kind of like the statistics and, and dry information into their messaging, into their stories. And really uh, a great, uh, great like I often open a lot of presentations that I, I give with this question, basically in the next five seconds, think of your favorite statistic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now in the next five seconds, think of your favorite story. And you probably have trouble picking just one story in five seconds and narrow down all the ones, all the possible ones that pop in here that you you love. Just think of of one that's your favorite is hard in five seconds. Whereas stats, you can't even think of one that you care about at all, or can yeah. even remember in five seconds. So 
companies, especially if they're doing something that's like considered, even if it's like a somewhat dry topic, like a battery uh, engineer sort of uh, message or something that's really technical and like people wouldn't want to read about like insurance documents. But if you have an animation that can tell the right story with right emotional elements to it and they're and a good uh, characters people can empathize with and, and get people's emotions involved, then not only will they watch the entire animation and, and enjoy the experience, but then they're much more likely to remember and uh, act on the, on the information in a favorable way because you presented it in something that made it fun to learn about and just and it it's much more impactful to the decision making parts of our our brains. I mean, it's something that is is fascinating and all really important for any company. That's basically it, any company does not actually do what their business does. They're in the business of selling what their business does to someone else. They need to convince people that what we we do is important. And so. If you're trying to inspire action in people and aren't using some sort of emotional messaging, you're missing out because as much as we like to think of ourselves as thinking beings that feel, we are very much feeling beings that occasionally think. And, the and actually, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of science behind what Carl says. Yes, it's not uh, just it's, rules of thumb. There's a whole yeah. great, there's a, a great book that I highly recommend um, people read called Predictably Irrational. It's one of my favorites. I don't know the author's name now, yeah. but it's Daniel it's Ariely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's all about I how... listen to it one time a year because it's so, uh, it's such a profound book, particularly yeah, rational. Like yeah, like, and, and when you look at it from that side, you're like, I wouldn't do that. Then you like to like recognize you're in a situation like, oh, I'm totally doing it now. And it's like, even though we we don't behave rationally, and it's the emotion that it controls the uh, the decision making, it's still a predictable behavior. So you can build systems around it, and so it. One of the things that we uh, really bring to our clients' uh, project is telling the stories with the right sort of emotional elements that are going to do, uh, have the highest chance of getting the response the client wants from their audience. And it's not something that you just kind of throw together a story and, and or any sort of message and get and expect those sorts of results. And so it's something that really uh, the, the value in what we do is, is coming from that story first perspective and from the client or the audience first perspective and knowing Hey, we want them to respond with this sort of response. What sort of story? What what do they care about? And uh, and what do we need to con communicate to get that response with the story? And then, what's the best medium to tell that story? Oftentimes, we we recommend animation, but sometimes it's maybe not animation. We can just help them with like website copy or some other story development that can help them uh, get the sort of results they're looking for. You know, um, oh sorry, Go ahead. Bruce. I want in a second. I'd love to hear your one of your favorite resources or books. Um, but to piggyback off that, Carl, you know, I I'm wondering if you have a favorite story from Predictably Irrational. And, you know, when we think of our favorite movie, our favorite book, our favorite comedian, we always think of what was our favorite part or story mm -hmm. of that particular, you know, yeah. book or movie. And in, in Predictably Irrational, I can't, Again, if you ask me to, to cite a quote from it or something or a statistics, I there's no way I'm going to remember it. But I do remember um, there's a scenario where he talks about, again, it's predictably irrational. Like, are you more scared of, for a child, guns or pool, right? And he talks about, well, if someone has a gun in the home, it's just scarier for some people. And But he's like, we're not scared of pools, but pools, I forgot what the stat was. I can't even yeah. remember to your point, Carl, pools kill, let's say whatever, five times more kids than guns do. And then there was another one that are you more scared of a shark or a deer? Right. And listen, if you ask me that question, I'm like, listen, I, I hear the jaws theme music of the deep end <laughs> of a, of a swimming pool. Okay. There's no rational. I'm like, I look at the drain as like, could a shark come up through that drain? Like, no, but, <laughs> and am I a scared of a deer? Like, no, but I forgot what the stat was to your point. X number of times people would die from a deer because you hit the cut your car. Um, you hit the deer with your car and then people die in that accident from yep. hitting a deer. So I don't know if there's any stories that stick out for you. Yeah, and anyway, go ahead. Yeah. They're, they're, I'm sorry. I'm going to cut you off there. Yeah. There's, yeah. Uh, there's a couple of examples of um, that had to do with pricing and how just like the different. So there's one the scenario they had like a, a Hershey's Kiss and like a like a tr chocolate truffles fancier. And they're selling Hershey's Kisses were like five cents and the truffles were like twenty five cents. And at that point, then they kind of got the control. Like how many people bought 
a little bit kind of different uh, amounts of each one. And they kept like lowering the price by a penny. But like the difference between four cents and five cents for a Hershey Kiss, no one really, no one really cared. And then like for the truffle again, it was like dropping by like five cents. It wasn't that much. But the minute you and people would buy like more of the fancier one, even though it's more expensive because they wanted the nicer thing. The minute the Hershey's Kiss dropped from one cent to free. Nobody touched the more expensive one, even though it was nicer. Free, just the way our brains work, free makes people's like they get super excited for it, and so like they're willing they they were willing to forego like the the quality amazing it, deal. Like you know, the truffle could go from a dollar to twenty five cents, and you're saying, well, now the truffle's five cents, and people still didn't buy it. Yeah, even though it was a great deal on the truffle, no one paid attention because the other one was free, and like a similar way of the way that free in, 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 uh, impacts behavior and it all kind of has to do with like the how money in, impacts our decision making is um there are two examples one was say you're you're uh in, in like your car is a flat tire in the, in the in your garage so you're basically on in the front yard of your house trying to fix a flat tire your neighbor walks by it's pre-covid so you can be close to each other whatever and he says <laughs> hey will you help me fix this tire on my car my car my tire's flat your neighbor if you're in good standing and you know each other for a while probably like sure i'll spend half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, fixing your, helping you fix your tire uh, because we're neighbors. And yeah, I want to help you out because I we're friends and like we went to the barbecue last summer and all, all those stuff. Same person, same scenario, but you say, hey, can you help me fix my tire for $3? They'll be insulted. Logically, you're now giving them three more dollars for something they're going to do for free but because there's money involved. They're now thinking about their time as in like a monetary sense. And then suddenly they're now insulted because they seem like, you seem like you're, not dying their time enough, even though logically they would have done it for free. Uh, another and a similar thing was giving away, like uh, before a sports game, like they could either like you could buy like a, a single Starburst for like a penny, or you, uh, like and people would buy like a ton of them because there's money involved. They basically buy a bunch for themselves. They buy like 10, 15. When you gave away for free, people don't take one or two because they want to leave some for other people. Hmm. There's like a social contract involved when there's no money. But once money enters the fray, suddenly people's decision-making is swayed by the people are more selfish and when there's money involved. So like all that stuff is absolutely fascinating. And it, you might be listening to this and going, I would never do that. Yes, you would. It's how your brains are wired. You can't. Like, you it's can, funny you say it's that. It's the, 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 the point of reference, you know, the, the yeah. reference for what the value is, the value reference. Yeah. And so, and it's something that, I, I mean, you can, even if you're aware of it, it's still like it's still you have to fight that sort of urge or that kind of the, the uh, propensity to to behave that way. You can override it if you're aware of it, but most people aren't really thinking about it, and so it really helps to know um, kind of how the brain works in this sort of way when you're creating marketing messages, or, or also when you're hearing marketing messages, it help you less swayed by uh, some of the things marketers do. To persuade people but just it's it's one of those things that even when you're aware of it you can't stop your brain from behaving this way you can only try and adapt to it i love it um bruce take us home with maybe a favorite resource book and any any comments so uh, a, a couple of things um favorite favorite book uh recent times is bill kate's radical relevance what is it called and radical relevance and okay. so the, the point is that if you are radically, if you are extremely relevant to your clients, everything's easier. And it's very much along the lines of thinking like your, thinking like your best clients. If, if you think like your clients, you're going to talk about what's important to them. You're going to see things the way they see it. You're going to express things the way they do. They're going to see you as, as relevant. So at the beginning of the uh, the pandemic, people talked about, oh, you know, how do I get heard above the noise? Everyone's, you know, Everyone's business is down there shouting louder. It's like you can't scream above the crowd, but you want to be as relevant. And if you are relevant, people will seek you out. You know, the, the, another stat from the storytelling from a, a couple minutes ago with, with Carl about how important stories are. I heard um, the presentation. I don't know the, the original source, but it, it makes sense. Is that they did a study and stories alone and stories plus data stories outperform the stories plus data hmm. that's how powerful they are and so if you can think like your clients you're going to be telling stories that are relevant to them and those are going to be extremely powerful 
and your competitors are going to be talking about just statistics or money. And that's even worse. That's how you can have a lawyer that the people complain about the hourly rate or how much of uh, animation costs. Carl, your animation, that's, that's expensive. If you tie it to, we're going to help your engineers so that their customers understand this technology is, is viable. The company now becomes more worth more. It, whatever they spent on Carl's is, you know, animation is, is trivial. Yeah. And if they think about it in that, those, those terms, the, the dollars, the same dollars are there, but they're, they're viewed entirely differently. And that's when I talk about, you know, having clients that will pay you more with a bigger smile on their face because it is worth more to them. They're seeing the right value uh, proxy. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, I want to point people towards um, your websites. And I know for Bruce, people can go to Eastwood, eastwoodsa.com. No, S that Eastwood SA, Eastwood Strategy. Uh, Eastwood SA.com. Is that the best place or any other places best, online? Best place. Okay. Yeah, LinkedIn, any, any place. Eastwoodsa.com. And Carl, for you, is it K P O N T A U dot com. It'll be squash and stretch dot net. That still works now, but it re redirects to the old got site. But got the new site launching in the next couple of days. So I'm really excited to have that going. And uh, it'll, this squash and stretch dot net will be the domain name. Squash and stretch dot net. Check yep. it out. If for more episodes of the podcast, you can check out inspiredinsider.com and check out some of the episodes. Uh, actually, a couple weeks ago, we did five types of content you should be created creating now. And I just want to thank you both for joining me. Thanks, Thanks so everyone. Much. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.